Hopefully I've met most of you, and thank you for coming out on Thursday to, to come hear me speak. Um, I, I try to go around the room to actually figure on out uh, what many of you guys wanted to hear about. Uh, some of the things that I heard is that you guys know what Red Hat is, uh, don't know what Red Hat is doing now. That was a big theme. Uh, the other one would be around a um, little bit about um, how the company grew on us, how do we make money, what's our business model, right? There was questions around that. Um, a little bit more about, you know, what you know, what does Red Hat actually sponsor in terms of open source projects, right? Linux happens to be one of the projects we sponsor, but there are many, many others that we sponsor. And then I'll go a little bit more about actually our entire portfolio. Um, is there anything I missed from, from any of the big topics that people wanted to hear about? No. No? <laughs> so I'm going to break it on up for... for Something about atomic, right? Oh, you want to hear about Atomic and maybe Docker? Uh, that, that's a really big thing right now. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we can go definitely do about, you know, Atomic versus uh, Core OS. <laughs> um, a little bit interesting stories from there. Um, okay, and then uh, what, what, what I was planning to go do, since we are a very technical group, I was going to actually split into two parts. So one part is much, much more high-level business strategy. This is where Red Hat's going towards. And then I'm going to go deep dive in one of the products that that uh, Red Hat is is really pushing behind in the cloud DevOps platform, right? And I'll give you a short demo of it because we're all technical, we're all smart. You want to see the guts, right? Show me the code, right? Thank you. Yep. <laughs> all right, so the first part, we're going to start with uh, introduction to Red Hat. Only about five slides, so uh, it's very, very short. Not sure if you know, but Red Hat's a 20-year-old company. We started actually at Halloween. Uh, for a lot of the people who, who started with us way back then, we actually made money by selling t-shirts and cups, because it was free, right? That was free, that's how we paid the bills, right? Uh, <laughs> And so at some point in time, someone, uh, one of the uh, founders of Red Hat said, well, you know what would be interesting? I wonder if people, you know, would pay for support, right? So just like when you're, I was mentioning to someone else, when the DSL gets broken or, or your cell phone doesn't work, like you call AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, Time Warner Cable and says, it's broken, help me fix this, right? And so we switched our business model from selling t-shirts and cups to selling subscriptions, support subscriptions specifically, right? So we kind of joke in the company that we don't actually, we're not a software company. We're actually a services company that happens to give software away for free, right? <laughs> um, so that was a little spin about things. What people don't know about is actually that we're using more than 90% uh, of the companies, uh, the largest companies in the world. Uh, we've actually grown through organically through acquisitions and through uh, direct hires. We're a little bit over 7,000 people right now. We're about $1.8 billion company. We're the smallest company on the New York Stock Exchange. Smallest tech company on the, small, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. What, are, what exactly does that statistic mean, 90% of Fortune 500 companies? So Fortune 500, it's, it's basically this ranking about uh, what Fortune Magazine comes out with the largest revenue cap companies, right? And if you pick that list, all those companies use a portion of the Red Hat products in there. Some use all of them, some use only a portion, but... But does that mean they primarily run Red Hat for the majority of their systems, or even... And no, it just, systems? it just says that they are a customer. Okay. Right, they are a customer. All right. So just uh, a little bit of, uh, about some of the companies that we have. Uh, New York Stock Exchange uh, actually runs almost entirely off of RHEL. Um, <laughs> People don't know that, but it is almost entire. I mean, 99%. There's some Windows machines for some people out there, but you know, majority-wise, it is it is all Red Hat, uh, Sabre. Um, so that's they uh, actually do airline ticketing behind the scenes. That's also primarily a lot of uh, Salesforce is almost entirely built off of the open source stack. Uh, from that standpoint, so it's just more than RHEL storage, uh, middleware the whole thing across the board, right? 
So these are just a, a small portion. Uh, obviously, we've got a whole big list of companies, but it's more than just a backyard. You know, some engineers kind of working in it and getting to work on, on various you know, platforms. It's grown to much, much bigger than that. So uh, what are the things that Red Hat actually does, right? So we actually break our business model, our product suite, into five different areas. You guys know mostly for us on the, on the uh, operating system, right? But actually we do storage, we do cloud, we do middleware, and we do virtualization. And I'm actually going to go down to some of the open source projects that actually drive those things, right? And the big thing about when we go to customers and we tell them about you know, the, the Red Hat and why you should do business with us is because we think open is better. Open source is a better way for you to develop better code, right? And so the thing is, is that more, you know, you know what they say, more eyes on the code, every bug is small, right? Uh, we also believe that we're a better price for performance. We think we get the best innovation by working with people like yourself to contribute, right? Even as users, right? Uh, you guys are part of the community, right? And but, but we have a whole bunch of other communities on out there, right? People who are business partners, people who build hardware, people who, who build solutions around our products, right? So we think we are, we're pretty uh, the bee's knees in that area. So uh, talking a little bit about how, you know, how actually Red Hat goes out to market. Uh, so on, on the left-hand side, I'll move on over. But the left-hand side represents the open source projects in the world, right? So there's about a million plus. Right? All these open source projects that are out there, right? right? So what Red Hat does is it goes on out there to the million plus open source projects and says, these ones look to be interesting, or they seem to be of interest that we think that you know, would def definitely make us a better, better you know, ecosystem for, for all our customers, right? So we go out there and we sponsor a lot of these projects. So people don't know, like a third of the committers of Ruby, the Ruby core team is Red Hatters. Right? We're the second largest contributor of, of, um, of commits for Docker. We're also you know, Apache Maven, Apache Camel, Apache HPDVD, you name it across Nginx, uh, you know, all these type of projects we're all, we're all involved in, right? Eventually what happens is that we get into this middle area and what the middle area represents is that Red Hat says that we're going to take open source projects and we're going to solve a business problem, right? And we get requirements from our businesses that says, you know, like for instance, virtualization, KVM, that's great, but you know what would be even better for a business? Like a UI, right? And, and a command line and a REST interface and documentation about how to go and deploy it, right? Instead of, you know, kind of like, here's the source code, here's the GitHub where you can download the code, and you go at it, right? So what we do is we form these projects, right, uh, which they're all open source, right? And we coalesce it around a business problem, and we create a community of it. And we try to be not the only one that, that's doing it. Right? Other people are doing it too, right? So you might have said KVM happens to be our, our community project. The commercial version of it is called Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. You might have heard of things like Gluster and Ceph. Those are open source projects. The commercial version of it is called Red Hat Storage. And, and even for Spacewalk, Spacewalk, uh, actually, people know it by another name, but it's called Puppet. Puppet is actually our open source version, a portion of it to be Red Hat Satellite. Right, uh, and then you can go down the board. Fedora is really our community version to to Rel, along with other various projects. And then the right hand side here, this is the commercial version. So what happens is that between the community project and the enterprise project, uh, uh, project, what happens? There's actually a six to nine month hardening process where we get get a cut of the code, a branch of the community project. We harden it and it becomes a Red Hat project. For instance, if you guys are familiar with Wildfly, uh, I'll get your question right back. For, for instance, when you're familiar with like maybe one of the projects called Wildfly, Wildfly used to be called JBoss. Uh, now it's called JBoss EAP in the enterprise market. Between the community version and the hardening process, there are about 631 patches over that six to nine month of hardening, right? Because really the communities are building like cool things. They're building stuff that, you know, build us the best 
best awesome version of this, right? With no restrictions of whatever it is, right? Well, what happens when it goes into Red Hat, there's actually a separate engineering team, and they're like going, well, there's, you know, does it work with Oracle Database? Does it, does it work with these OS platforms? Does it work with this, you know, uh, you know right? The, the, the community may or may not test actually any of those features, right? But they got it working, right? So that's cool, right? Uh, so that's kind of like the differences. And then, and then also on this right hand side, they also provide is enterprise support. We provide actually up to 10 years of support. So we will backport uh, security, performance patches, everything across, and you can have that operating system in support for 10 years, right? So some people are running still like RHEL 4, RHEL 3 <laughs> in production environments, right? And that was like, almost more than 10 years ago, almost clearly. Like, close to that edge, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, gentlemen in the back, I had a question. Yeah, as part of that hardening process, how do those patches get fed back into the community? Yeah, so what happens is that, what happens is that uh, most of the community, pa uh, community projects, they don't actually backport. Uh, like, for instance, if you're on a version of, say, for instance, Fedora, and you're on a and and there's another Fedora version that was two years ago, right? And their patch comes out for the newest Fedora. They don't typically pack backport to to that to the oldest, right? To the to the previous version, right? That's the difference between the community and the enterprise version because we pay someone to go and backport all those fixes, right? And our goal here is that not to hold the patches and enhancements in our version. Our goal here is that when we find out a fix we actually put it back into the community stream, right? Or else we'd have to constantly do is emerge every single time there's a new version. So we go back to the source, patch the source, but unfortunately, it's the latest source, not the source that was five years ago, 10 years ago, from that standpoint, right? Um, so that's how we kind of work from that standpoint, the differences between some of the enterprise versions and the community version. So a lot of people say that when they're, they're, they're you send OS and it breaks, the answer is, just use a newer version of Sun OS. Um, so, you know, there are some people that can do that. There are companies that cannot do that, right? And so they need something much, much more stable, something that has uh, a release cycle that is not in, like, every week there's a new patch or every month, but they need something that's, you know, much, much more stable. Right? Any other questions about that? Right? All right. So uh, people say, how do you actually make money? So this is actually an eye chart. Uh, it's actually what we go to the companies. Uh, so these are the Fortune 500 companies we go to. And a lot of times they are using something like Windows, Solaris, and we say, or AIX, and you can use RHEL for that. Other places may say, I use NetApp for storage. Well, you can use Red Hat storage for that standpoint. I might use VMware for virtualization. Guess what? Red Hat virtualization does something similar from that standpoint. So across the board, basically what we've done is that, that a lot of the open source projects that are out there happen to be engineers that are trying to fix the problem, right? And so the thing is, is that it just so happens businesses need those same solutions too. So what we've done is basically almost nearly a mapping of most, some of the most popular commercial products from that standpoint. So that's why I kind of mentioned that we have more than just RHEL. We're pretty much across the board. You can actually build almost the entire infrastructure from network storage, uh, operating system, virtualization, middleware, all the way up to the top. You can build it all through Red Hat technology if you choose to do so. Any questions? Back, back to your previous thing, um, I know that I, I heard rumors sometimes you guys make patches and have trouble getting them folded back into the community. community. Yes. Exactly. So what, what is your experience with that? How does that interaction work? So that's really interesting. So um, I, can t I can tell you, well, here's one issue that I, I ran up to, right? So uh, I happen to be a Java developer, so that's my primary primary language that I, that I use. And so uh, one of the products that we, uh, we, we sell is this thing called uh, Red Hat uh, Fuse, which is our ESB, our Enterprise Service Bus, right? And the community project for it, it happens to be called Apache Camel. Uh, and it's a way for you to go and glue like format A and output format B. You could do you know, protocol translation. You can do uh, uh, 
uh, formatting, translation, all this type of stuff. So it's like kind of this translator babble fix for 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 for, for, for programs, right? And uh, we submitted actually a brand new UI, a really great UI that was much, much more easy to use uh, to the community, to the Apache community. And the Apache community rejected it. And they said, and we asked why. And they said, because this would make it too much of a Red Hat only thing, right? We don't want this project to be dominated by Red Hat employees, Red Hat committers, right? We don't want, we don't want you to push the, 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 this enterprise-y type stuff onto the community itself because you're just adding technical debt. Debt that we have to go and carry forward in our, in our distribution, right? So we have situations like that that happen. So sometimes in that case, that code has to sit with only our distribution because our customers want it, enterprise customers want it, the community doesn't. But our goal here is not to go and <coughs> uh, not submit patches upstream to the rest of the community, right? That's not our goal, right? Um, that's, you know, that's, that's the intent. Any other questions? Mm. Along those lines, though, when you guys have actually hardened and committed and are trying to get the patches back, what happens when the project is already actually patched in a different way? So this is a good part uh, if it's patched a different way, right? It, it usually community uh, votes, uh, very, you know, different projects have different ways of doing uh, voting. Mm -hmm. So like for instance, uh, a lot of the Apache projects use Garrett, and so there you have to do vote, vote mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. That's down point. But what typically happens, you'll, you'll see the flame wars on mailing lists. I mean, that's really the, what it happens, right? Yeah. So remember when, when, uh, remember when uh, the bash uh, vulnerability happened? Community came out with one version, right? And then the Red Hat employees wrote back and says, uh, you didn't patch this, 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 right? But the first patch came out to Red Hat on, on the Red Hat subscription channels, the supported, you know, RHEL satellite. Uh, Red Hat Network, which is how we distribute patches. It came the first complete version, right? When the when we told the community that they missed this, 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 right? Red Hatters submitted the new patches to it, but they didn't get it until day three, day four, as opposed to a zero day for the Red Hat customers, right? Because the debate was going around for the last two, three days. Do we commit the, the Red Hat patch? Do we do the, the one that we have? You know, it's just... <laughs> Join one of the dev commit lists, and it's a lot of fun. It's better than daytime TV. Better than daytime TV, right? I agree. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I, I would say just a third of my team are committers uh, from that standpoint. Uh, and we always, you know, it's good, it's good coffee talk, your talk about what, what actually happens. So uh, people say, like, how do we actually make money? Uh, this is really what the way we go and do it. Uh, we have these things called subscriptions. You want to actually don't buy a license. We don't sell you a license uh, at, at Red Hat, right? What we do is you get a subscription. So you can buy the subscription, install it, and then on day two, you can say, that's it. I'm not paying for another subscription. I'm going to just run it, right? Uh, you know, that's your choice from that standpoint, right? But typically, a lot of the companies find that there's value of getting like patches every month on stuff that, that they need, right? To make sure they're co compliant or whatnot. Uh, there's also other things we'll have, we can, you can request some account to have a Red Hat engineer be assigned to your, to your, uh, to your company, right? We also have uh, special subscriptions for developers and for academia, right? Um, we also have programs for you know people who embed our products from that standpoint. But yet again, the idea here is the, the software, right? The source code, it is, you get it. That's how it is. Tell us a little bit more about your special developer's licenses. Does that apply to someone who is a hobbyist who is who's doing things in their house? Yeah, so the, the question is, is does the uh, developers or hobbyists, does that, uh, do those subscriptions apply to you and whatnot? Um, yeah, it, it could be. There's a lot of people who actually go and have is a uh, developer subscription and whatnot, and they get access to basically access at redhat.com. And so, you know, as you can imagine, you know, Red Hat is a company, and so it's, it's this symbiotic relationship with the community, right? So 
Uh, engineers got to get paid. We got mortgages too, right? Uh, so we have most of our documentation, if not all of our documentation, behind the fire, the paywall, the subscription paywall, right? So that's where you get, you know, you've got the community how tos, which are great, and the forums that are great, but then there's also the Red Hat versions of that, and that's the official. What you know, documentation about how it's supposed to be done, right? And you can ask questions. They have this. They have like a staffed, uh, uh, a staffed hotline for you to go call. You know, you can ask anything you want about anything, essentially, when you have a subscription. So, what is the the difference in cost for a developer subscription? Uh, and so the the question is, what's the uh, cost difference between uh, the developer subscription? I am not a salesperson. I don't really know. Uh, there's a. I could probably ask somebody. <laughs> and I'm sure if you go to the Red Hat site, there's probably like ask a salesperson on the bottom, right? Um, but uh, I don't think it's very expensive uh, from that standpoint. It may be zero cost. It may not be zero cost. But from what I from what I understand too is that. Um, that's not where, uh, to be honest, that's not where we make the money yet, right? We make the money on the Fortune 500 companies. They pay for all the R&D. They pay for the development. They pay for the Red Hat staff, right? And so the thing is, is that, you know, and for, for them, we told them, if you pay for our engineering and our R&D, we're just going to give it away for free as source code. You know that, right? Like DS, you know, DOD and NSA and all those other acronyms, right? You know that, right? And they said, yeah, we understand that. So... They're fine with it, right? So we said, okay, that's our business model. We're going to give everybody everything for free. So, and what they pay for is support and the engineering expertise, right? Because they're asking for, like, how can I make this work as like a, a supercomputing node? How can I do Hadoop type jobs and big data type jobs? How can I go and have is a resilient piece of hardware that I need to survive in some portion of the world, right? And so they engage Red Hat engineers to build a lot of those, those features. All our, all our code that we have, that we built, wasn't built because of some, somebody in the business saying, we need to build this thing, right? It was no, it's requests from the, our customers that said, I need this feature, right? Like, you know, real-time Linux, whatever. It's, you know, we want that, we're willing to pay for you guys because you guys are smart people can then figure out in hard engineering problems, then we'll build it. Any other questions? All right. So uh, this is the last slide of the of the Valve Red Hat. Uh, you know, we're actually an S and P 500 too. A lot of people don't realize that we're actually an S and P 500 company, uh, and also on the New York Stock Exchange. Right. We're the largest open source company in the world. Uh, we hope that there's going to be more. We champion the uh, subscription model that a lot of other companies have copied, like Salesforce and Workday uh, and others. Uh, it's kind of interesting, right, um, about how the company has grown on up. All right. Any other questions? I'm going to switch over the tech side from that standpoint. Is this good enough for the business side for everybody in the room? <coughs> All right. So, um, so usually when I give that presentation, uh, this is where really the first time for a lot of like, when I go to a lot of companies, they don't actually understand what, what Red Hat is. They think we're a bunch of like uh, neckbeards that kind of just, I, I, don't, I have no idea, but they think we're just behind a keyboard the entire time, right? And I, I tell them, no, we're actually doing a much, much more, much more interesting things from that standpoint. Although some of us are neckbeards. Um, and you should see our own version of, of uh, discussion groups inside of, inside of Red Hat. They're just as good as the, the public ones. <laughs> um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of our, our big things. So um, the, the hot term in the industry right now is DevOps and PaaS, right? Uh, are you guys familiar with what is a PaaS? Platform as a service? Kind of? From that standpoint, all right. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys have you guys ever used something like Heroku uh, or Google Compute Cloud, right? If you have, the Red Hat OpenShift is is the Red Hat version of those that product, 
right? You're going to see something very similar. Uh, DevOps, I'm going to talk a little bit about that a little bit more. But basically, I only have a few slides, and I'm going to go into deep technical detail how it's actually built. So the first thing about DevOps is, uh, how many of you guys know about DevOps? Okay, we got a few people in the room. Excellent, right? Uh, so the story of DevOps, how it actually came about is in 2009, uh, somebody went to the Velocity, I'll, I'll name the, who, who the person is, but uh, this company went to the Velocity conference and told a really shocking statement in one of his presentations. And he said, you know what? Our company deploys code out to production 10 times a day. 10 times a day in 2009. Right? And they're like, what are you guys thinking out there? Ten times a day? Nobody does this in real life, right? And that little company was Flickr, right? That, that did that. Ten times a day. And they said, how do we think about software engineering? And they said, we think of it as much, much <coughs> different. What we think about things is, we think that we should go and do small chain sets, we should say, you should build the software one time, deploy it one time. It should be all automated. For you to build a cluster, for you to build your application, for you to go and do anything you want, all that environment should be built up for you, right? And that was revolutionary at the time. And then, then you move forward to what today is, like you hear these words called continuous integration, continuous de development, right? And the idea here is that they're moving from what was before a craft like building your environment, it was very much like, you know, kind of like, you know, hand building a Ferrari or a Maserati, right? And you're kind of like fitting all the parts, scripts were a little bit different, building environment was a little bit different, right? And somebody got to, to the point to say, we can automate this just like a piece of machinery, right? We can build it so that it's assembly line approach to things, right? And so in a nutshell, that is what DevOps is trying to achieve with IT, right? To get to that level of, of efficiency with the environment, right? So you get uh, companies like today, like Etsy, they do the same thing, but they actually do it 25 plus times a day, right? So people have now gotten to the point where they've automated so much that can, they can get to these type of deployments, right? So this is essentially what OpenShift does, right? It allows you to get to these things. So all the characteristics that I talked about, the, the chain sets, the, the, the engineer, to automatically build and deploy, right? Things that used to take three weeks, four weeks, six weeks for you to go and build an environment, now it only takes minutes for you to build those exact same environments. So. I'll tell you a little bit about the architecture. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve, and I'm going to show you a little bit more in detail. So OpenShift itself is actually built off of two main, uh, several main components. Number one, we have a broker, and the broker actually is the orchestration layer. This is the brains from the environment. This actually goes and says how many instances of the web server I need, how many instances of the database I need, right? I see that we need more capacity, so automatically, dynamically scale sideways from the environment, right? Brains of the operation, the orchestration engine. And then we have the nodes themselves, and these are areas where the application can potentially get deployed on, right? All of this sits on top of RHEL, and this environment can run on bare metal, on a private cloud, on a public cloud, or on any virtualized uh, piece of software, right? And that allows you to have the flexibility where things like Google Compute Cloud and Heroku can only run online. You can't actually put, put it into your four walls, right? So some, some companies find it very valuable because they can have this, they can cope, keep the infrastructure entirely inside of their, their environment, right? Uh, the other thing I, I, I kind of didn't mention for the, for the guys who are a little bit uh, hip on stuff, this actually right now, these nodes themselves, uh, the plan is that it's going to be atomic. So they're going to switch out this rel to, to atomic. Nodes themselves are going to be actually swapped out for Docker. And Docker is a provisioning technology. It's a container for the guys who actually are old Solaris admins. You might have heard of Solaris containers. This is basically Docker is doing that thing. And that's actually sponsored. They got $40 million in VC funding, I think, this year. 2013 Open Source Project of the Year, right? 
our broker, although Red Hat uh, built it, uh, actually we're using Kubernetes from Google. So the, the, the orchestration engine, how Google scales out horizontally, that's actually this same engine that actually does that. So that was the good end here, which? Kubernetes, oh, Kubernetes. The, 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 the broker itself. So do the nodes run a single application? Uh, sorry, your question is? The nodes, do they run a single application? So, so the question was, do the nodes run actually a single application? No, <laughs> it's just a container for where multiple applications can sit in. So I'll go to the next chart, which will zoom in onto uh, one of the nodes, right? So what happens here is that we've got rel here, and then these things, what we call up here, are called gears. And so gear could be application A, application B, application C, application D. It could be A, yet again, on, on the same node. So on the physical you know, rel operating system, you can have multiple instances of the application running. Because the idea here is that we're moving to a different type of concept. The older applications that used to be built for you know, the, the, the non-web world, right? They, it's very much what we liken it to like an animal. We give it a name, if it's, if it's sick, we kind of heal the server back up, right? It's like, thank God, please get it back up and running, right? And we try to fix it, check the logs, check this, da 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 da, right? Put HA, put backup, put everything, like make this thing bulletproof, just like if it's a pet, right? Just everything we can do for it, right? And in the new world, what we do, it's very much like a farm. If the cow gets sick, you take it to the back, you shoot it, and put it on the back, right? And the data automatically moves on over. It's automatically ready for work. I'm ready to go and do my, my next thing, my next task, right? Uh, so there's no healing. There's no none of this other. There's a sick note. P.S. You know, kill hyphen nine. You know, <laughs> there, there you go. All right? And then a new new node applet, new gear happens to pop on up, and the, the application keeps on going, right? Uh, so how do we harden it? So uh, bottom here, I kind of mentioned. So it's it's Red Hat Linux. It's actually SE Linux that's the underlying. We use C groups to actually go and uh, and ma manage is the uh, processor. The, the processor, yeah. the memory, <laughs> all that other type of stuff, right? So that's how we kind of lock and harden it, so that one application and one gear cannot access the memory or the resources of another application, right? So we get a truly containerized type of thing. That's why we can offer this to companies and say, no, you won't actually have a breach, and the breach won't go past this area, right? So, um, I'm going to go to the developer workflow. So I'm not sure if you guys are all developers, but I think you guys can follow along because you guys know enough about this going on, right? So uh, the first thing here we have is uh, configure, right? So the configure step, I want to go into the tool itself, right? And the idea here is that you actually build your cluster. You're going to actually go through a web-based admin, build your cluster, and it'll provision this on out. The next steps we have is develop, push, and build. And that's very typical, right? You have you write your code, you write your code on whatever it is, right? Command line, IDE, whatever it is. You push it through uh, what we use as Git. And then it automatically, the environment will build the code as it sees fit and deploy it out into the environment, right? The final step you have is scale. And at the scale part, this is the hardest thing for anybody who's in the, in the infrastructure, who's been an IT admin, is like, how can you make this become like a one node, and then in five minutes, a hundred nodes, right? How do you get that to actually, actually happen automatically, right? Or manual intervention, if you like. So I'm gonna switch on over, and I'm gonna switch on over to my browser, right? So I want to log into uh, OpenShift. This is the, the website. I'm using the online version. I'm going to log on in. All right. And it's logging in. So what happens here, once I'm logged into the tool, right? you'll notice that you know, I have an account, whatnot. I can go and quickly just add an application. So once I click here, there's 
actually going to be a catalog of applications that I can pick. So I can pick Java, I can check PHP, I can pick Python, I can pick Ruby, I can pick Node.js, I can pick Go. I can, there's all these what we call our cartridges that people have been building from that standpoint, right? So I want to pick one, just PHP from that standpoint. If I click on PHP, what it will do, it will ask me a series of questions. It will say, you know, pick my URL. So I'll go, you know, Albert PHP 111. Or, uh, here, let's say, SGB. SGB, right? So here's my public URL. Oh, SGB. Yeah. And I've lived here my entire life, too. Uh, so SGB, right? And I can actually pick here what my gears are. Small, small, high, CPU, medium, large. I'll pick small. And I'll pick scaling. And I can actually pick the region. And these regions is configurable. It could be your own data center. Here I'm using Amazon uh, AWS, right? Or you can make a hybrid of that. So when I usually go to customers and people are looking at this product, they'll say, I, you know, depends on what SLA I want to go and achieve, they can go pick where they want these servers to be actually placed or where the application gets placed, right? So I'm going to go click on, you know, create an application. So what it's going to do right now is that it took my request, it sent it to the broker, and the broker is actually contacting AWS through the REST interface, and it's provisioning out that environment for me. All right. So let me just go back really quick. Oops. That's down point. So because this is the first application that's allocating a new server, can you configure uh, containers within the server and how you, how you stack your applications up? Uh, yes. Yes, you could. So uh, the question was, is how configurable is the environment, right? And you get all the source code job. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not going to give you that answer. That's actually a web-based UI to go and do all those type of things, right? So I can show you when, you know, the, the you know, behind the scenes, uh, you know, on a one-to-one -one if you're interested. Uh, so, it, so let me go to the next step of the process. You saw configure, and I kind of mentioned those those cartridges, you saw what those were, right? So it depends on your various applications. Some of the cartridges are actually built by Red Hat. So like PHP, Python, Go, whatnot, a lot of them are built by Red Hat. But there are other companies that have actually built their own cartridges, and they sell them as an add-on from that standpoint, right? So that's a really a mix. If you wanted to earn some extra bucks, build some cartridges, right? And have people use your cartridge and get paid for it, right? So think about uh, things like that, right? So the next step we have is steps two, three, four, right? And two, three, four is really what I mentioned is develop, push, and build your code, right? We don't actually force you to go use any specific tool itself for you to go and develop your code in. So if you're very comfortable in using like TextPad or VI or Emacs or you know <laughs> Eclipse, IntelliJ, you know, it doesn't really matter from that standpoint. Feel free to use your tool of choice. And then the thing is, is that you use Git to push it into the environment, right? And then, then you'll see me actually go, and I'll, I'll do this right now, uh, to go and build that environment out, out for you. Okay. So, first I'm going to go here. So, before I, 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 I do that really quick, I'm going to go show you a little bit more about the environment. So now that it's provisioned the environment, you kind of see how the way it... it, it uh, I want to show you that you know that it wasn't smoke and mirrors. If I click on SGB uh, hyphen testing uh, one red hat com, you kind of saw me enter in that URL. It actually provisioned the PHP app <coughs> on the live for me, right? So this is the you. It's a live URL. If you guys have a laptop, feel free to hit it, right? Uh, I just did it on the fly right now. So let me go in there and actually make a code change, right? So, uh, first thing I'm going to go do is I'm going to go to Sandbox from that standpoint, right? <clears throat> the, the first thing is that you want to go is you want to uh, clone the environment. I'm going to paste this, right? 
It's actually cloning an SGB project onto my desktop. It's asking me for my RSA fingerprint. Great. Cloned it. I get an SGB folder. I get an index.php. I want to just change the page really quick. Welcome SGB to your to your PHP application. I'm going to git add, git commit, right, git push. At this point, what it's actually doing is that I, you saw I made it a change to just one of the files themselves. It's actually stopping the gear, uploading the changes on in, deploying the app, and then re-bringing that back on up, right? Did, did you upload your keys before? Yeah, I uploaded my keys before from that standpoint. So you don't want to see me upload keys. <laughs> yes. So <clears throat> you're just using bare git to interface with it. Bare, bare so git. Does that mean your gear on the back end is watching the git repo for changes to come in? Yes. Cool. And so what happens if I go back here and I push refresh, welcome SGB to your PHP app. It's that simple for you to go and do from that standpoint to, that's to update GitHub, hooks, right? Huh? Was, you actually did that with GitHub's not. Huh? It's GitHub's that actually did that, right? It's actually, uh, oh, so, uh, yes, but there's also the idea that you can add is Jenkins if you want to make it more complex. And there's pre and post for, for, for what you can go and do in, it, inside the GitHub. Because the is actually what stopped your servers. Yeah. But, and, and there's all that a, stuff in the background. It, 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 yeah. So there is, <laughs> but uh, that's a deal. instance watching it, the git, I'm just pointing that. Yeah. Do you guys get what I was saying? It's like, how did actually the repo, how did the website actually sense what was going on and actually respond back to the, the new changes in the source tree, right? <laughs> so uh, I'll show you something a little bit more complex. Uh, we can do that a little bit later. <laughs> so, you know, uh, um, you, you kind of saw here, was the the develop push build, right? You saw that. Easy for you to go push on and build it on out, right? Now, what happens is that if you have uh, multiple gears, right? What happens if you go and want to deploy this to 100 installations, right? So what happens is that that same script that I run, that git push from that standpoint, Actually, it will go and federate that same code base out to 100 gears, 1,000 gears, and we will take them down accordingly, update, and bring them back on. And at no given point, the application is actually down. So you're running 24 by 7 with, with five nines the entire time that you're doing this entire thing. Right? The next step we're going to talk about is really the scale part of it. And let me go and show us that a little bit more about behind the scenes. So what, what we're doing behind the scenes here is that uh, what if you wanted to go and expand that environment, right? So if I go back to the page preview right here, right? You'll notice that I might want to change things like here it says storage. If I click on storage, I can actually add more storage to that gear on the fly. I can just go click on that size and click save, right? The other thing that I potentially want to go do is to, to sort of say, how about the scales part? All I have to do is this is this minimum of one, maximum, it'll go to however size it, that you put as a max from that standpoint. So this theoretically can grow up to 16, right? And how it does that is basically what we've done in the front and behind the scenes is that actually you have HA proxy right in front of it. And so what happens is HA proxy is monitoring requests coming on in and it talks to the broker and the broker provisions more gears on the fly as needed, up to 16. And it also is smart enough that if, if any of the gears are idle, it, we have this uh, process called dehydration and it basically will go and shut down gears as needed so that you're efficiently using the environment as much as possible, right? So, here we have is I'm going to show you HA proxy. You can kind of see there's one gear that's running from that standpoint, right? If I clicked here and just clicked on, say for instance, two and push save, what it's going to go back on out is that it's going to find another node, and the algorithm is smart enough to sort of say, don't pick the same operating system that your first gear was on. 
pick another one so that you have some resiliency across OSs and even resiliency across hardware if it knows those, those things. So at no given point in time, none of the, there's always something that would have the ability to, to take requests in the system itself. Right? So while this is running, right, um, uh, what it's doing uh, behind the scenes is it actually is finding a new, new uh, node and a new gear to provision another other application on, right? Um, any questions about how that kind of works? Right? Mm -hmm. Lots of cows, yeah. multiple cows. Don't put them on the same ranch. Don't put them in the same state, right? <laughs> Spread them across as much as possible and and federate that on out, right? Can you go into more detail on how it interfaces with the load balancer as, as you push updates, as it stages things down? Yeah, so the thing is, is that we've already wrote, wrote a little bit more of the you know, hooks for a lack of a better term, but there's a lot of scripts that are behind the scenes. What the orchestration engine does is that it's actually going on out and figuring out whatever the algorithm is, whether it's based off of page requests, CPU utilization, whatever it is, right? And it actually goes on out and provisions the deprovisions. And there's actually even processes. We have uh, uh, basically something like Zookeeper. I'm not sure if you know what Zookeeper is. But anyways, uh, what it is is make, is make sure you don't have rogue gears that are out in the environment, like hanging threads that are zombied from that standpoint. So it goes and eliminates uh, any of those as needed. But uh, the, the general gist is every single time we bring up a gear, it's doing constant registration with that, with that, right? And even if you saw the way that I just provisioned a brand new URL, right? Just imagine, for some places, I have a, one of our largest customers has 10,000 developers. Can you imagine them asking for a new website? I need a new dev environment. I need a production environment. I, need, I, I want to be able to test the full production environment but smaller. I want to use the same exact setup, right? And they can go into this self-service tool, click, 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 and next thing you know, 10 node cluster. And when the real production version is maybe 50 node cluster of the same thing, right? Reacts the same way, same scripts are being used from that standpoint. In fact, most customers, what they go do is they, they just go and use the same installation. It's just that the firewall only allows is these mapped virtual IPs will go through. Right, which to me is that uh, SGB. But if you look behind the scenes, SGB actually maps to like gear 1A37354, blah, 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 right? And it's da 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 da. Like this, you get a, it's a little bit crazy from that standpoint. So here we have the, 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 the node has been updated to two, right? And if I push refresh here, right, you'll actually see a new node, new gear appear on the HA proxy. Right, and uh, uh, usually after five minutes they'll shut down because there's no workload that will it'll force it back down, right? Unless you put the process that the minimum was always going to be that size. Where is the proxy located in comparison to your nodes right now? Yeah, so so the thing is is that uh, HA proxy right now is sitting on one. It's another gear that's uh, uh, another know, gear that's inside of that node <laughs> environment. Right, and so the thing is, is that we have also the ability to have multiple HA proxies for, for high availability. But the idea here is that you can go. I mean, it, at the very end, it's all Linux, right? I mean, you can shell into the environment uh, from that standpoint and be able to do all the things that you want to go do. But what we've done is that we figured out how do how can companies go and do like pure DevOps, right? Be able to have that self-service, be able to develop this type of like environment instantly and fast, right? Because you imagine, in a normal corporate environment, you'd have a storage admin, a network admin, an operating system admin, a middleware admin. Like these four guys would go on in. Each one would be doing, you know, you know, a little bit of the work, right? You know, get this to a cluster configuration, get this to a backup, make sure it's at the right security policies for the company. Da 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 da. I've bypassed, I've not bypassed, I've implemented that all into the infrastructure in once. All right. So, uh, you know, just talking a little bit about that. All right, so. <coughs> What, what is um, 
interesting about this is that if you go to most startups today, so I used to work for a startup, I'm not sure if you know Score Big or Priceline for sporting tickets, name your own price, five star tickets, Lakers game, yes or no, 50 bucks? Okay, anyways, it's two blocks from Hollywood and Vine. We got funded for $8 million uh, by uh, Capital Bay Ventures. We've got another 14 Series B and whatnot, right? I mean, this is all the stuff that the startups are doing. Every single one. If I told you the companies that are using this platform, right, you'd be like, really? So that's how they push code every single day, nearly every single hour, right? I mean, can you imagine what used to be, you know, five years ago? even three years ago for you to go to just something like this, right? And what I didn't show you on the cartridges too on the website is that I have actually other ones implemented on the site too. Um, if I click on applications again, right, you'll notice that some of these other ones here have MongoDB, right? I was able to go and if I could click back into SGB, right, You'll see here, databases to add. If I wanted to add MongoDB to this SGB website, click on Mongol, right? Small, medium, large. Add cartridge, guess what? Deploys on out a cluster configuration of MongoDB, right? Oh, guess what? Uh, I need monitoring, uh, and I also need the web-based admin rock Mongol. Guess what? Another two clicks for you to get that monitoring environment on up. If you don't like the hard, if you don't like Mongol, rock Mongol's monitoring, we have a, a cartridge for New Relic and for App Dynamics, right? And Zabbix and all the other open source projects too, right? So, you know, for you to get a full, you know, three tier environment, you got all this stuff. So, <clears throat> going back. All right. So, you know, talking a little bit about uh, OpenShift. So. You know, uh, some of the other things I didn't show you, right, was that we have Node.js environment. We have an ESB, uh, Enterprise Service Bus, that's also part of the cartridge. We also have a business process management uh, tool uh, that, that's also a cartridge. We have a, um, an, our version of Memcached. We have a rules engine. Uh, there's all these little pieces that we've already built cartridges for from that environment, right? And if you sign up on OpenShift.com, we give you three free gears, right? So you can just go on out there, you know, there's no code like Albert or some special thing like that. But you, if you sign on up, we give you three free gears just straight on off, right? And if you, are, if you have an open source project or you have an academic project, Red Hat will sponsor your OpenShift account, right? But if you're a big business with billions of dollars, you get the enterprise version of which you'll pay for. All right. So you know, be before I, I, I uh, stop with the uh, with the uh, discussion, uh, I usually like to end it, uh, end my uh, meetings with a question. So why were brakes invented? <laughs> anybody, anybody has guess why were brakes to, 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 to make it safe for you to stop? <laughs> right. Stop. All right, so a lot, yeah, that's a good point, right? So I have actually a, a slightly different take, right? And I say, well, you know what? Brakes were invented, it's a piece of technology, but it's a technology that allows you to drive fast, right? That was why it was invented, for you to drive fast, like 260 miles fast, right? So, I, you know, that's the thing about us in, the, in, this, in this industry, right? The thing is, is we get better and better tools, right? And the thing is, is that why are we doing it one way when we can get exponentially faster another way, right? And so there's these platforms like OpenShift that provide you this, this type of environment, right, for you to go do things, right? And so like, every, like, like with every open uh, Red Hat project, we have is the community project, which is all on GitHub, Right? You can download that, don't pay a cent to Red Hat, go at it, it works. You get these cartridges, you can install it on your own machine, if you have a little data center like me at home, you can go and install it, it will go and, you know, there's a shell script you run, answer a bunch of questions, boom, 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 an hour later it's all installed, right? Easy, right? But if you need support and services and cartridges and all that other type stuff, you need somebody to do the work for you, right? You can buy the enterprise version from Red Hat, right? So um, that's that's it for my talk. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, this is just one of the projects that uh, this is one that I work most actively on uh, at Red Hat, 
right? Some of the other ones, uh, if you're interested, I can come back and talk about OpenStack. That's a little bit interesting. You guys know the story about OpenStack? Some. Some of it? Mm -hmm. All right, so, so what, what happened was um, Rackspace, they're a hosting provider out of, uh, out of Phoenix. Them and NASA went to Amazon AWS and said, you know, can you build a version of Amazon AWS for us? And then Amazon said, take a hike, right? And then they came to Red Hat and says, can you build a version of AWS for us? Sure. It's called OpenStack. <laughs> so if you ever see OpenStack, and if I ever show you like the UI screens, I'm not saying that it looks like a one-to-one -one copy to Amazon AWS, but it'd be like, you know it's like a, not a twin sister, but it's in the family. Right? It's, it's very, very close. And, and, open, and open shift from that standpoint, the, the nucleus of it came actually from one of those uh, now really rich you know, uh, internet companies. Right? They basically, a lot of the companies came to us and says, give us basically how the way companies like Flickr, like Etsy can deploy code so fast, but we want it in the commercial world. Right? And so we built this. Well, uh, thank you for uh, coming again on, on Thursdays, yet again, right? Uh, um, and if you have any questions, uh, me and the other uh, red guy, uh, red hat, red right in the back, would be happy to answer any questions uh, that you'd like. All right. So thank you.